overly dependent on apps for the answers, for social connection, even for our sense of ourselves. There's a danger that we look to apps first before we look inside of ourselves. And if this happens, if we start to see more of our apps than ourselves in our experiences, our actions, and our self-expressions, it's our argument that we've become app-dependent. Now, in our research with colleagues at Harvard, Howard and I have considered this tension between app enabling on the one hand and app dependence on the other within three spheres of experience that are particularly salient for young people, particularly adolescents. Their sense of personal identity, their intimate relationships with other people, and also the ways in which they exercise their creative and imaginative powers. So we call these the three eyes of identity, intimacy, and imagination. So to explore how today's app generation experiences these three eyes, we collected data from a wide variety of sources. So we we're asking a big question of how are kids different today, if at all, from kids 20 years ago and before. Um, and it's really hard to answer such a big question. So we kind of had to do some triangulation here. Um, we started off talking with educators, veteran teachers who had been teaching for 20 years or more, um, and we just started off very broadly and asked them individually, have you noticed any changes, anything different? We didn't mention technology at all, but invariably they brought it up and very quickly in the interview. We took the themes that we identified in those um, initial interviews, and then we conducted seven separate focus groups with uh, adults who have been working with kids, again, for at least 20 years in a variety of different capacities. So we talked to arts educators, music teachers, after school teachers, we had camp directors, uh, religious leaders, therapists, and so on, to really get a sense of how these different people had, um, what sorts of things they had seen among kids over the last 20 years in lots of different contexts. So my favorite, personal favorite focus group was the camp directors because um, one of the camp directors brought his banjo and at the end of the focus group he led us all in a camp song which was really fun. We also looked at what kids had been producing themselves over the last 20 years. So we were looking in particular at their uh, visual art and also their creative writing. We did this work at Harvard Graduate School of Education and within that school at Harvard Project Zero, which has a real emphasis on arts and arts and education. So, um, you know, that part of our research was really important in that life. And then finally, we spoke to young people themselves, really important. We interviewed and surveyed over 2,000 young people, um, both in the United States and also in Bermuda, which is where I'm from and where I was a teacher. In the book, we use this research from all these different sources of data to explore how the app mentality manifests in each of the three eyes of identity, intimacy, and imagination. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take each eye in turn and share some select themes and highlights from the book, starting first with identity. So as I've noted, apps are very much tied up in their external representation that visual icon that evokes a particular brand. And it appears that the identities of today's young people are increasingly externally packaged. So that is, they're developed and they're put forth so that they convey a certain desirable image of themselves to a particular audience. And usually that audience is not us as adults, it's usually their peers. Now apps and the social media platforms that apps provide access to really seem to encourage this emphasis on personal packaging and branding. Um, so consider the emergence in recent years of status updates, selfies, profile likes, becoming Twitter famous. All of these things are symptoms of this trend. Now one effect of this packaging, this emphasis on performing to external audiences, is that focus on the inner life may be minimized including reflection on one's values, goals, and dreams. And in fact, there's a part of the brain called the default mode that um, is very active when we're actually focused inward rather than outward. And this default mode um, is implicated in the development of empathy and also self-understanding. 
Now, on a more distinctly positive note, today's youth have opportunities to explore a wider variety of identities in the vast array of communities that you can find online. So communities related to music, um, fan culture, civic engagement and gaming. And this identity exploration is really an important part of adolescent development, provided that it doesn't harm the self or others. It also appears that youth are more accepting and welcoming of a wider variety of identities in other people. So whether these identities are related to race or sexual orientation or even personal interests. And it seems reasonable to suspect that the internet and social media platforms have played a role here, helping to connect youth to people across various geographic and cultural boundaries and in the process expanding their knowledge and understanding of people who are different from themselves. So with respect to intimacy, we find, and it's no surprise, um, that youth are always connected, of course, both to their friends and their parents. So let's take parents first, because I found this pretty interesting when we were doing this research. We found that today's youth are connected to a greater degree and also for a longer time in their development to their parents. Now, in many ways, this is a really positive development. Parents and their children seem to be closer than ever. So that's great. But how much connection is too much, especially during adolescence and emerging adulthood, when an important developmental task, at least in Western cultures, is to gain a sense of autonomy and identity that is distinct from one's parents and one's family? So consider one study that we came across during our research for the book um, conducted in, at Middlebury College and it found that college kids on average are in contact with their parents 13.4 times per week. Um, now I don't know about you but I was when I was in college I did not communicate with my parents 13 times per week sometimes no times per week but if it was one time per week it was you know it tended to be kind of a long conversation and I would fill them in on what I did during the week these 13 times are not long conversations, they're just kind of little check-ins about how their day is going, asking for advice on different things. It's a very different feel. So it really is that idea of not being ever separated from one's parents. Now in our own research, when we talked to the camp directors, one of the camp directors told us that parents often send their children to camp with two cell phones one to turn over to camp personnel at the beginning of camp in compliance with the rule of no cell phones, and the other one to hide under their pillow so that they can keep tabs on their kids. And as this camp director told us this, the other camp directors kind of nodded and said, yep, that happens all the time. So with respect to friends, really kids are using digital media mostly to communicate with their friends. And certainly, digital media, apps, and, and everything else allow youth to stay in constant connection with each other. But constant connection doesn't always translate into deep connection. And of course, it's hard to connect deeply with any one person when you're trying to keep in touch and keep up with hundreds or even thousands of friends and followers who are all across multiple social media platforms, all while listening to music, doing your homework, and maybe even watching a TV show or movie on Hulu or Netflix. Related to this, we've witnessed a certain reluctance among some youth to show vulnerability in their face-to-face -face interactions. After all, they tell us it's far easier to share personal feelings kind of at an arm's length and through a screen rather than by looking at someone eye to eye. So consider the connection to apps. As I noted earlier, apps are ultimately shortcuts. When it comes to relationships, such shortcuts can make interacting with others much quicker, easier, and also less risky. Because again, you don't have to confront someone face to face. And if the conversation gets uncomfortable, you can just close out the app at any time. Now, if these shortcuts are used in moderation and to augment rather than replace face to face contact, they can and they do support meaningful relationships, and we've seen a lot of evidence for this in our research. But if they're used to replace rather than augment, or if they start to get in the way of sustained deep communication, apps may facilitate superficial ties 
and lead to relationships that are more transactional rather than transformational. So consider the dating app Tinder. Has, hands up if you've heard of this app. It seems like people, I'm not gonna ask if you're on it, a lot of the people at this conference have heard about Tinder. Um, so, which I find interesting. Um, so it's a, basically, it's a very stripped down dating app. It shows you pictures and very basic facts about the people um, in your immediate area. So basically what you do is that, image suggests is you swipe through the pictures. If you find someone attractive, you swipe right. If you don't, then too bad for them, you swipe left. If two people both swipe each other right, there's a match. Um, and they may decide to meet up offline. Now, of course, there's nothing to say that this app couldn't lead to meaningful in-person relationships. But anecdotal evidence suggests that many young people, and actually many adults, um, use it as a way to facilitate casual hookups. So in other words, purely transactional one-time interactions. Um, and apparently it was quite popular earlier this year among athletes in the Olympic Village because it's location-based and very easy to find each other. So lastly, imagination. A sizable portion of the app ecology is devoted to supporting artistic production. There are apps for drawing, painting, filmmaking, musical composition, pretty much any artistic genre you can think of. And digital media in general, not just apps, have opened up new avenues for youth to express themselves creatively. And these avenues are quicker, they're easier, and they're cheaper than they ever have been before. So they really are lowering the floor so that more kids can enter into the artistic um, production, and then they're also raising the ceiling of what's possible for them to create with these new tools. But it's important to consider, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that app developers constrain artistic expression in specific ways. So for instance, if you're using a painting app, your color palette is going to be limited to the hues that the designer programmed into the app. And if you're using a music composition app, your tonal range is going to be similarly limited. Now, of course, enterprising and sophisticated users, many of them who are youth, um, can create their own workarounds and they can break free from the constraints of the underlying code. But realistically, most people are going to work within the parameters of the original app. And this raises important questions about how such digital boundaries affect the creative process. So which is it? I've kind of set it up. Um, where it can kind of go either way. Is technology either supporting or is it undermining youth's creativity? So I, I pose it to you, Whether what do you think? Is it, it on the whole, do you think, raise your hand if you think that technology is supporting young people's creativity, okay? And raise your hand if you think that it's more undermining, potentially, possibly one or two, okay. So definitely more optimists in this audience, which is great. Um, so, to answer the question, our research team decided to look directly at what young people had created over the last 20 years, and we looked in two domains, their visual art and their creative writing. So here I'll go into a little bit more detail about our methods and then some of our key findings. So we drew our visual art sample from a teen literary and art magazine um, called Teen Inc. Um, it has been published since 1989 in the United States. And we developed a very detailed coding scheme. Um, and we had master students in the arts and education program at Harvard who helped us with this coding scheme. And they had fine arts uh, training. And in total, we coded over 350 artworks, half from the early 1990s and half more recent pieces. And here's just a very, very small sample of what we looked at. And it was really a real fun part of our research. So this is our extensive coding scheme. It's actually got more subcodes than this, and I won't go through all of them, but I have highlighted three to show, share with you some of the key findings that'll give you a sense of overall what we found in the visual art data set. So starting with background, we looked at, so we kind of singled out each particular part of the artwork, and when we looked at back, background, we categorized pieces according to how fully rendered they are. So as you can see from these examples, 
the early pieces often contained blank backgrounds, and um, whereas the later pieces tended to be more fully rendered. There was just a lot more going on in the background. We also looked at the composition of pieces, so how they were positioned in the visual plane. And as you can see from these sample drawings, the early pieces were more likely to be more or less centered, whereas the later ones were more likely to be slightly off-center and also to display some stylized cropping. Then lastly, we looked at medium. We looked at a variety of media that you use to create their visual art. So we categorize them generally into two overarching categories. Media that are more traditional, such as pen and ink and drawing and painting, and then the less traditional media, such as collage and digital art and found objects. Now in the more recent pieces, we find far fewer pen and ink drawings, um, considerably more artwork that involved non-traditional media, such as mixed media um, and found objects. Whereas the earlier pieces, um, the majority of them were actually not just traditional media, but pen and ink. So on to creative writing. We analyzed writing from both middle school students and high school students. And again, we created a, quite an extensive coding scheme that looked both at the structure of the writing and also the content. Um, and I've highlighted a few um, of the codes that I will uh, go into a little bit more detail on. So starting first with genre, we categorized pieces according to what genre they were. So were they absurdist? Were they historical fiction? Was it an epistle? Um, and what we found when we compared the earlier pieces to the more recent pieces is that the earlier pieces tended to display more fantasy elements, more absurdist themes, um, whereas the later pieces stuck pretty much more to the everyday and the mundane. They're more formal realism. So just to give you a sense of the earlier pieces and just kind of how out there they were, one of the stories was about a protagonist um, who goes to see his therapist, but his therapist is a crab, and they have kind of an interesting conversation. Um, by the end of their conversation, the protagonist picks up his, um, his therapist crab with a pair of tongs and takes him home to boil him. So very kind of strange. Um, Another one, there is a city, and one morning, people in the city wake up, they go outside, and they see that there's a mirror dome that has been erected mysteriously overnight in the city that is reflecting back to the city all the crime and corruption in it. So really very inventive, creative um, premises for stories. Um, whereas the later pieces tended to stick closer to home. So if it was a high school student who had written it, tended to be that the protagonist was a high school student and doing something to do with what high school students do. Um, we also looked at structure, and what we found here kind of mirrored what we saw in the genre. So the earlier stories tended to kind of bounce around in time, or some of them just didn't have any story arc at all. Whereas the more recent stories typically went lockstep in chronological order. We looked at voice, and here we found that the earlier pieces, more of them tended to be in first and second person narration. Um, the more recent pieces tended to be narrated in the third person, which tends to be more traditional. We were also interested in how young people use language um, in their writing. So there's a lot of talk about kids today talking and writing and net speak. So we wanted to see, well, is this going to be reflected at all in their writing? Um, now, we did not see any evidence of net speak in their writing. We didn't see any LOLs or BRBs, but we did see differences. So in the earlier pieces, the language tended to be more formal, more kind of academic sounding, whereas the more recent pieces tended to have more informal slang and even a lot of made up words. So that we thought was pretty interesting. So overall, we really actually see two divergent patterns. We see on the one hand, the visual art becoming increasingly complex and less conventional. Um, and we also see in the creative writing, less experimentation and greater adherence to the everyday and the mundane. So also worth noting, particularly for the writing at least, the role of education in the last 20 years. Um, and particularly in the United States, this focus on 
standardized tests, teaching to the test, and really making sure and emphasizing that kids pass the test. They master that five paragraph essay um, so that they don't fail. And that sort of environment doesn't, isn't very conducive to risk taking and um, creativity. So a final reflection on creativity in a digital era. Creativity scholars sometimes talk about big C and little c creativity. Now, big C creativity consists of the truly groundbreaking original works of art that can really change a domain permanently. So think of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Pablo Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, Martha Graham's Frontier. These works of art really change the domains of painting, um, music, and dance fundamentally going forward. In contrast, little c creativity is found everywhere. It's, it, we do it every day by solving um, the problems that we encounter on a daily basis, adapting to change. Our research leads us to conjecture that digital media may be giving rise to and actually allow more people to engage in a middle c creativity that is decidedly more interesting and impressive than little c creativity, but due to the built-in software constraints and also obstacles to deep engagement that multitasking presents, decidedly less groundbreaking than big C. Now to be sure, there's a place for all three forms of creativity in any society. But the types of disruptive, groundbreaking innovations that really move societies forward rely particularly on the latter. So back to apps. We're often asked, Howard and I, to identify apps that are enabling and apps that promote dependence. Um, our answer may not be too satisfying because we say that any app can be used in a more or less dependent or enabling way, though many of the apps that we've sampled, particularly educational apps, tend to lean towards um, app dependence. So consider this app, Doodle Buddy. It is a drawing app. Has anyone used this app before, perhaps? A couple? Oh, actually quite a few. Um, so when we looked at this app, we found that it can actually be used in either an enabling way or a dependent way. So let's look at the enabling way first. So we start with the interface, and we start with just a blank canvas. We choose our colors and our um, drawing implement, and we are somewhat constrained here, but really we can just go at our um, blank canvas and just create whatever we want and end up with this masterwork. So in the app dependent version, it's a little bit different. It's the same app, there's a different setting. So we start off the same, same app. Um, but here in this setting, we have a selection of prefab images and backgrounds. We choose a background, we plop it onto our canvas, we choose some figures, we arrange them in any way we want, and we kind of end up with sort of paint by numbers type of picture. So what can we do as educators, parents, and even designers of apps to tilt the balance toward using apps in an enabling way and more broadly speaking, to encourage youth to live their lives in an app-enabling way and not give up their agency to their digital devices. So the first thing is we need to look at our own actions and how we use technology and model app enablement for young people, moderation in our technology use. Adults, for better or worse, are powerful models for kids. They're watching us. They're watching us with their phones and our tablets and our laptops and so it's really up to us to show kids that there's a time to put these devices away and be fully present. We think it's important also to provide young people with app-enabled experiences that really emphasize open-ended exploration and personal initiative over more structured, top-down, and constrained activities. And this applies both to online and offline experiences. And then it's really important to teach computational skills so that kids really understand how technology works, how apps work, what they can and what they can't do, so that they can modify existing apps and also create their own apps if they want. And then finally, designers have a responsibility to consider whether their apps lean toward enablement 
or dependence. Now, of course, you never know exactly how your creation will end up being used, but we would hope at least that they would think about this distinction between enablement and dependence during the design process and attempt to design so that users are encouraged to use apps in an open-ended way, as non-constrained as possible. So to give you a sense of what a big impact educators and parents can have on kids' dispositions to app dependence versus app enablement, consider this um, study that we came across towards the end of our research for the book. It was conducted by a psychologist, a psychologist named Elizabeth Bonowitz, and it's actually not directly about apps, not even about technology, but it really does demonstrate quite powerfully this difference between teaching for app enablement versus teaching for app dependence. So in the experiment, um, young children are brought into the lab and they're presented with this very intricate toy, um, something they've never seen before. And there are all sorts of things you can do with this toy. There are, it can make noise, there's music, there are lights, there's a mirror, all sorts of things. Now, there are two conditions, of course, it's a lab experiment. Half of the kids come in and the experimenter shows them exactly how to use this contraption. And then the experimenter leaves and the child is left on his or her own to do whatever they want um, for as long as they want. In the other condition, the experimenter comes in and starts to tell the kid how to use the toy, but then she's called out mysteriously and doesn't really get a chance to show the child how to fully use this. And again, the child is left on his or her own to explore uh, the toy for however long they want. And what they found was quite a large difference between the two groups. Um, in the group where the kids were showed exactly what to do, they actually gave up playing with the toy quite early and they didn't really come up with a lot of different ways to use it. Whereas the group that wasn't shown how to use the toy um, engaged with the toy for much longer and came up with a wider variety of ways um, to use the toy. So it really does demonstrate how powerful we can be as teachers, as parents, um, and how much we can influence how kids use um, and, and learn. But why does this even matter? Apps are fun, they're convenient, they make life better. So why should we even bother to teach for app enablement versus app dependence? So consider this quote by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. And we open the last chapter of the book with this quote. He says that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. Now on the face of it, this sounds pretty great. And there are plenty of examples of apps that take care of mundane tasks for us, like laundry, grocery shopping, hailing a cab, and other daily chores. And ostensibly, that frees us up to engage in more meaningful, fulfilling life experiences. But the question we have to ask ourselves is where does this outsourcing end? Consider the movie Her. Hands up if you've seen this movie. Okay, hands up if you've heard of the movie. Okay, just about everyone. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the movie, I actually highly recommend um, watching it. It's, it's a really interesting movie and raises all sorts of questions about our relationship to technology. I won't give anything away, but just briefly, it's about this guy, Theodore Twombly, played by Joaquin Phoenix, and he falls in love with his operating system. And you can't really blame him, though, because her voice is narrated by Scarlett Johansson. Um, <laughs> But a scene that sticks with me actually happens right at the start of the movie, so this doesn't give anything away. Um, and the camera starts to pan out from Theodore Twombly, who is sitting at his work cubicle at beautifulhandwrittenletters.com. And as the camera pans out from him sitting there, we start to overhear the other workers dictating surrogate letters on behalf of grandchildren thanking their grandparents for the birthday present, on behalf of friends, um, thanking them for their the wedding presents, and so on. So it's, it's a, it opens up some really important questions. Is this where we're heading? 
How much of ourselves and our relationships are we willing to outsource? Are we prepared to outsource child rearing to apps? Are we already doing it? So I didn't Photoshop this at all, but there's actually a product um, that's being sold called an activity seat. Um, when I first showed this to Howard, it took him a while to understand that it is this, this baby is looking at an iPad and engaging with whatever app is on the iPad. It's quite, <coughs> quite amazing. Um, but we end the book on a decidedly optimistic note with a conversation between Howard and his then six-year-old grandson, Oscar. And this conversation really does give us hope that perhaps members of the app generation, maybe with some of our help, will find their way towards app enablement. So I'm just going to read um, to you from this last part of the book. So as the book was just about finished, Howard had the opportunity to talk with Oscar um, about his experiences with digital media. Now, except for Howard's checking with Oscar's parents beforehand, he wasn't prepared or prompted in any way for the chat. He allowed Howard to record the conversation and in fact, when the interview was concluded, he showed Howard how to shut off the uh, recording function on his iPhone. So not surprisingly, as a child born in 2005, Oscar has always been surrounded by digital media. He is completely conversant and comfortable with the terminology and jargon. Howard asked him what would happen if OPA, which is what Oscar calls his grandfather, took away his iPhone. Oscar says, I would not be sad. I still have a computer. Oscar says, oh, what, what's it like? Oscar answers, bigger than my mom's. Howard says, what do you do on it? Oscar, search on toys, go to .com to do something like herofactory.com, little things. I can write a little code into the line so I can play some sort of game. Howard was a bit taken aback at Oscar's ease with terminology like .com and activity, write a little code. And so he asked Oscar if he ever Googled anything. The following exchange ensued. Oscar says, I Google everything. Amazon, like anything I need to go to Google or write it down. Howard said, you sound a bit exasperated. Oscar, kind of, but I'm not sure I know what exasperated means. Howard moved next to what one does and what one does not do with computers. Here, Oscar made a very clear distinction. Howard said, I grew up without computers. What do you think that was like? Oscar, people would do all chores and more chores and more chores and no fun. <laughs> Howard, no fun? Oscar, a little bit, but not much fun. Howard asks, do you use computers for school and study? Oscar at age six says, I don't really do those things. I just use my computers for fun. Howard asks, how do your mom and dad use computers? for only one thing, Oscar says, work. My mom downloads things like that she has to do, like does work about food in my school. At the time, Oscar's mother was doing graduate work in food science. So it appears then that Oscar makes a rather sharp division, kids' computers fun versus adults' no computer, no fun, or adults' computers work. But were computers merely a source of pleasure and amusement for Oscar? Howard decided to push him a little bit on what digital media did and did not mean to him, and what they enabled and what they prevented. This conversation proved most illuminating with respect to how Oscar sees the world, his digital worldview. So Howard asks, how do you feel when your parents say, put it away? Oscar answers, feel a little blue, a little blue. Howard asks, how would you feel if your parents took all your computers and phones away for a few weeks? Oscar says, I feel a little blue, but I could actually have a little more freedom. Play with my toys, play with Aggie, his then eight month old sister, go to places with mom and dad. Howard asks, what do you mean by freedom? Oscar explains, mostly people have technology, his word, no prompting from his grandfather, they're watching every game and do it all day and don't do anything else, but just watch TV. So you can play with toys and things like that without technology. Now, Oscar is certainly not a student of digital media, 
nor has he read about utopias and dystopias. And yet, at the tender age of six, he already senses that one can become a prisoner of the new technologies and that a world beyond them is beckoning to be explored if there were just time and space to do so. He has figured out that there is virtue and even reward in finding out things for yourself, on your own time, in your own way. I'll stop there. Thank you.